All right, so I decided to do something a little different this week. Um, I was going through my, my resources and my materials, what I have, and I realized that I actually have quite a bit for surveying, and I don't want to cut any of it out. So before I had this, I said that we were going to be talking about surveying and transportation today, and instead, we're just going to talk about surveying today, because, or geomatics, because um, we there's a lot to cover, and I'm not going to cover even everything with geomatics. Uh, I'm stopping short of curves, of horizontal and vertical curves, because I'm going to save that for the transportation review, because I don't know how uh, uh, Dr. Bryce or whatnot covers uh, curves, but our, 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 the horizontal and vertical curves is sort of, I think, where transportation surveying starts to blend a bit because you start doing that uh, in transportation. So I'm going to do a review tonight of just the surveying stuff. Um, it is a section on, in its, on its own on the exam, and the thing about the surveying section is it's, I don't think it's hard. I, it's my general philosophy with a lot of what we do on the exam. I don't think it's hard, but I think that a lot of what we do in surveying sort of requires you to remember methodology more than anything. When's the last time you balanced a level, a differential level? It's not hard, but it's like, oh crap, where does this number go and how do I do that? So I think it's worth going through that exercise, you know, what the hell is the difference between an azimuth and a bearing and all that stuff, because that's the type of stuff you're going to get asked on the exam, making sure that you know how to manipulate degrees, minutes, and seconds on your, or on, on, your, uh, on your calculator. So that's the kind of stuff I want to talk about tonight. And so I think we're probably going to end a little early, but if we had done this and transportation, we'd be here for a while. Um, also, in case anybody wants to go to the special metal section or session at six, we should be out by then. So they're looking for folks. So money, money, money. All right. Okay. So we're going to do some uh, some geomatics review, and I, I did. I started this out a little bit like the econ review, if you recall. Like we had some example problems, but then we said, well, well, let, let's take step back and let's you know what the heck's a present value, a future value, and an annual worth, and what are those discount factors, and how do you apply them, and so on and so forth. So I've got some diagrams, and I want to determine the azimuth and the bearing for each of these, okay? So should be pretty straightforward. I want to see if you all remember how to do this. Let's start off with A. Um, anybody know what the azimuth is? Well, first off, let's go back to square one. How do we define an azimuth? Remember? remember? The distance from north, north distance. Angle from north, right? So north is zero and going clockwise. clockwise. So what would the azimuth be for A? Seven. Seven. There you go. So this azimuth is 70. Now what is the bearing? Anybody remember how to do that? So what what is a bearing? So a bearing might be like north so much east or south so much west, right? So how do you start by defining bearing? You start by vertical coordinate, right? Either north or south, and then you turn so many degrees either west or to the east. So how would I generate this angle if I was looking at a bearing? Well, I'd start north, and how many degrees would I turn towards the east? 70 degrees. And so that's your bearing. Okay? And so if you understand that, let's look at B. What's your azimuth for B going to be? 145. 145. And how do you get that? We have to start at north and turn. So your azimuth is 145 because it's 55 plus that 90 degrees. All right? Now that's your azimuth. What is your bearing? First off, what quadrant are you in? The bottom right. So we're southeast, right? <laughs> so south 35 on the 14th. Is that right? You said south 35 east. 
That's absolutely correct. It's not south 55 east because you start south, then you go over. So it'd be south however much this angle is. And how much is that angle? It's 90 minus 55. So that's south 35 east. Not too bad. How about C? Help me out with the uh, azimuth. What's the azimuth? 315. 315. Exactly right. Alright, if you got that, now help me out with the bearing. There we go. I'm being consistent. Lastly, let's look at D. What's the azimuth? May help me out. Say it again. Two sixty. Two sixty. Now the bearing. South eighty west. South eighty west. Okay. All right. When's the last time you looked at that? <laughs> 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 Alright. Okay. Now, what might be surprising is that, um, and, and I don't know what you covered in geomatics. I think when I taught <laughs> geomatics, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I covered, when I taught geomatics, um, I didn't cover the area stuff um, very, in very much detail. But there can be some pretty uh, um, uh, involved problems on determining areas. Okay, so I do want to take some time and discuss that. Now, what I have here is a. Uh, uh, I have a, a region, so I've got, you know, on the horizontal direction, basically these are lots, if you will, and they're split up in 30-foot segments on the bottom, and then the, bound, the property boundary sort of zigzags all over the place, and so we have, you know, 34-foot, 21, 23, 29, and so what's the area of this region, okay? Now, one of the reasons I'm, I'm showing you this problem is, look, what is the area of a trapezoid? Like, like, how would I determine the area, let's say, of this region? Does anybody have a shortcut way of doing it? I would just do a square and a triangle. A square and a triangle, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to average these two numbers and multiply by 30, right? Because if this is 34 and that's 21, you can sort of find that middle distance and treat it as a single rectangle. But the problem is you have to do that for every single one of them, and it would be kind of a pain. I want to show you something. So if you go to civil engineering, I gotta find it. I think it's in the transportation section where the curves are and whatnot. Here we go. So here I'm in sort of the transportation section, if you will, of the of the um, uh, of the manual. We start looking into site distances, uh, peak hour factors. We've got highway capacity, traffic flow relationships, all that stuff. Uh, we get into pavement design. Y'all cover pavement design in transportation a little bit. So the word super pave and ASHO structural number. But okay, all right, good. Um, here's your formulas for horizontal curves. When you look at your vertical curve formula, not only do you have you know your expressions here, but if you look here on the bottom. There's a series of formulas by which to compute area. I'm going to show you this one. Now, if you understand this, you definitely understand that. But I'm actually going to show you this one as well, because this is a pretty slick formula. And I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's the area by coordinates. If you know the coordinates of a polygon, like the, the x and y coordinates of each uh, 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 vertex, you can compute the area really, really easily. Okay? So I kind of show you how to do that. But this trapezoidal rule, let me screen capture this. Right. 
so here's our formula, and this is pretty straightforward. If you want to determine the area, all you have to do is you take the width, and this term here, this width, is just that, so the, this 30 foot width. So you take the 30 foot, and you multiply it by the following. So you take this height plus this height over 2, and then you just add each of these others. So we can say, we'll call this uh, H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, H6. And so this is going to be 34 foot plus 23 foot over 2 plus 21 foot plus 23 foot plus 29 foot plus 31 foot. That's it. What happens if you check this out? Have a second on that? So 3975 square feet, the answer is C. It's, it's, it's that simple. So it's a, it's a trick that you can use to compute the area very, very easily. You basically just take the segment and you split it up into even widths and then take those intermediate heights and plug and chug. Okay? It, it's, it's, it's really straightforward. Does anybody have any questions on this? Now, I want to show you this one. Um, first off, let me, I'm going to need a notebook on this one. All right. So, we have a, a region here. It's a, it's a polygon, and we're going to determine the area of this polygon. But I'm going to show you how to do this using the method of area by coordinates. Okay? Now, to be clear, I don't think that we really need to do that on this problem. This is a very neat shape. You know, it, you, I can very easily break it up. But it's very possible that you're given a shape that, you know, looks all, you know, sorts of messed up. And, you know, this coordinate is 4,062.3 comma 19,856.1. And then imagine six coordinates like that now determine the area. That's pretty pretty nasty, right? So I want to show you a, a little algorithm to determine the area of a, a random polygon. And, and to be clear, this is a very relevant topic in geomatics because if you're doing boundary surveys and you're trying to mark properties and, and whatnot, you need to know the acreage, the total, you know, um, uh, the total area of a of a given property. And so th this is really relevant stuff. Um, in fact. This is also kind of how software programs compute areas of polygons. They do it like this. So let me show you how this works. It's pretty slick. Oh. Oh, Lord. That is good. OK. Now, I'm going to, for, for the sake of posterity, I'm going to screen cut the formula. It looks horrible, doesn't it? Looks horrible, right? Trust me, I promise you it's not. You're like, Dr. Mike, come on. You gotta go check or something. <laughs> it's too late for this. I'm so crazy. <laughs> It'll be quick, I promise. Okay, watch this. Okay, so notice how we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, and then it goes back to A, right? So if I wanted to define the property, I'd start at A, go back to A. So watch what I'm going to do. So points, so we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the x coordinates and the y coordinates. So what are so just so everybody's awake, what are the coordinates of point A? Zero, zero one. 
There we go. Okay. What about point B? Zero, three. Okay. All right. Everybody's away. All right. So, two, four, six, three, six, one. Uh, what is that? 3.51? <laughs> there is a reason that the problem says most nearly. <laughs> So one uh, one point five zero, then back to zero one. Okay, watch this. You're gonna like this. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna do two columns, and I know this is gonna sound a little strange, but I'm gonna have one like this, one like that. Right. What I'm going to do. And so here's why they're drawn like that. Let's take this first column. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do that. And I'm essentially going to do some multiplication. So what's that times that? <clears throat> Zero. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. There we go. It's pretty easy, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to do the products the other way. You are aligning this out and aligning down, right? That, so it's like this. It's like, so 1.5, 0, 0, 1, and then it's in the middle. It's like that. So I know Kind of like you're doing your back at as much as you want. Kind of, yeah, like a level. How you know you put your height of the instrument in the middle? It's kind of like that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go the other way. All right. So the first one, what's one times zero? And then, 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 two. Okay. Now, why did I do that? That pattern of multiplication follows what that formula would look like if you expanded it. Now, notice how the y-coordinates in this formula are subtracted. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to subtract each of these numbers. That's 0, minus 6, minus 18, minus 12, um, positive 2.5, minus 1.5, positive 1.5. Everybody see that? Sum that up and tell me what it is. 33.5. What's that? I think it's 33. Minus. Does anybody see anything on the very, very end of the formula? So I propose that the area is one half times the absolute value 33.5. So when we're looking at formula, let's say I get on the FV, mm -hmm. and I don't remember this, but I have the formula. Yeah. Yn, is that G? Yn is G, yes. Okay. Which is why, see, if you notice, like, see how it went A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then the last point goes back to A? Yeah. So, so the N, in this case, is G. So... If you want to write the formula out, you can. I think this is a little easier. Now, just to show you that it works, I mean, watch this. Like, if I look at the shape, I can take this rectangle right here. And the area of that is going to be 12, right? This is 2 times x. Yep. This, if I look at this, 
the area of that is six wide, one tall, so three. And then the area of this, one tall and three and a half wide, so 3.75. Wait, no, no, 1.75. So, Have y'all seen that before? Oh, you have? No, no. Not, not that breakdown, but what you just did is what I would have done on the yeah. exam. Yeah. Well, I saw the and let me be clear. Let me be clear. That is the right way to do it for a problem that simple. But what if I give you, hold on, but like what happens if I give you a shape like this? And I say the coordinates of this are 4026.3 and 19. 63.1, and this is, you know, um, 7286.1 and 1293.6. You know what I mean? What if I do that? You know, I'm saying you could do this and have the area like that. That is a very possible problem on the exam. That's why I'm showing you. I'm, I'm done. Is there a way to do that in a matrix? What's that? Oh, I'm looking at it. Just is there a way to do that in a matrix? This question. So there's the formula for determining the area of a triangle. If you have coordinates, can be determined using a determinant. Like you set up a three by three and take the determinant and put the half on the outside. That that's a common way of doing it. And that's basically where this comes from. Is is a linear algebra formulation. So um, I think that's harder to memorize than this. And the advantage of doing it this way is this you can handle an inside of polygon of any any side of any dimension. So as long as it's a closed area, you can handle it. Sound good? Alright. How about something maybe a little more familiar? Okay. All right, so this is an example looking at cuts and fills. Have you done cuts and fills? Okay. All right, so this should start to get a little bit into transportation land. So, again, you've got a, a property as is and finished grade. And so you're going so on a route project. You're going along with stations. Y'all remember stations? So how long is one station? 150. Okay. All right. So we go along. <laughs> you like that? Yes. All right. So you go along. And so with this particular property, what's happening is, you know, here's me looking at the side of the road. Um, so. So. Here's probably what it sort of looks like. And so to get from, let's say, station 20 plus 00, zero to station uh, 20 plus 40, on the beginning, I'm going to have to cut some of that earth out, or sorry, or, sorry fill some of that earth in, at the end, cut, uh, cut some of that out. So the question's trying to ask, actually, that should be backwards. Beginning, I need to do some fill. At the end, I'm going to need to do some cut. Okay. So, what I'm trying to do is determine the total volume of, um, of earth from either I'm going to need to fill on the project or I'm going to need to cut from the project. So, hopefully, by now you recognize that the overall goal on a construction project is to man balance your cut and fills. You don't want to bring in too much external fill to a project. You, if possible, like to make cut and fill. Balance, right? So at the beginning we've got a fill, at the end we've got a cut. Let's see if that balances, and if not, are we going to need extra fill? Now, okay, I didn't expect that, but. Okay, so here we Make that a little bigger. 
So there's probably a hundred different ways of setting this up. I'll sort of set this up the way that I do. I'll draw myself uh, a little table. And there's going to be a lot of rows to this table, so just bear with me. So we're going to start off with our station. So what happened? What do we do? We start off, we go from station 20 to station 20 plus 10 and a half. So I put a blank row in between. I think you'll see how this is going. This is a common theme among survey tables. I always leave that blank line because that's sort of where you do the, the calcs. And we've got cuts and we've got fills. Now, between these two stations, so we have a cut here. We don't have any cut here. This one is 1864.42. This is 468.88. Right? Okay. Now, ultimately what I'm going to be doing for this, uh, this calculation is I'm going to be using what's called the average end area method. Does that ring a bell, average end area. So if I have some shape that has an area here and has some area here, so this is area one, this is area two, the volume is going to be A1 plus A2 over two, the average times the length, right? So what I need to do is I need to figure out a couple of things. First off, the length. What is the length? So if I'm taking these two stations, what's the distance between these two stations? What's the length? 10.5 feet. If we start at station 20, go to station 20 plus 10.5, that distance is 10.5 feet, right? So, with that, I can determine the volume of cut and cubic feet and the volume of fill and cubic feet. All right. So how do I do that? Well, first off, what's the volume of cut? Well, between these two points, there's no cut. Okay? We're not cutting anything on this station, not cutting anything on this station. So that's going to be zero. As for the fill, how do I determine the volume of fill between these two stations? Well, I'm cutting this much out of this station, this much out of this. Average those two, multiply by the length. And so what does that come out to be? Do I have a second on that? So between those two stations, I need about 12,000 cubic feet of fill. I don't need any cut uh, out of that station, but I need that much fill. Hopefully that's balanced out later. All right. Now the next station is 20 plus um, 21.5. Now help me out. What's the cut and fill on that station? What's that? 154.14103.66. All right. First off, what's the length between these two stations? Or 11. 11 feet. All right. 
hopefully this should start to get a little boring here pretty soon. So do we have any cut? Yes or no? Yes. And how do we determine that? Average of that and zero times that. And then for the fill, average of that and that times that. So what does that come out to be? 8.7.8. And how about Phil? Does this ring a bell? Y'all done this before? Oh, okay. good. 3148. 3148. That's what's Assuming everybody else is getting similar values. So next up, all right, help me out. The fill, I remember zero. What's the cut? 696.75. All right. So difference between those two stations is what? station left. Anybody got a cut sum for me? 
the, the basketball uh, uh, court. I don't remember exactly where it is. I want to say it's near the bank, but it's, it's right there on the, the, the grass. You, you know, you've seen it. So uh, it can be a, a USGS monument. If you're starting from absolute scratch, that's one of the best resources to determine an elevation. Um, it can also be, if you're working, let's say, on a construction project, you can set your own monument and just keep referring to that over and over again. Very typical on a construction project. The overall goal with a differential level, with a leveling operation, is to determine elevations. Okay? So, for instance, um, it's very common for a surveyor to do a differential level if all they're trying to do is a flood elevation certificate. So, do you all know what I'm talking about, like with the floodplain? With the easements? What's that? With like uh, property easements? Property easements, flood insurance. You need an accurate elevation of your property. So this is an easy way to do it. You have an established monument, run a different differential closed loop, and there you go. Okay, so the way, so let's talk about the math. All right, so you start off with a known uh, uh, elevation. So we call this the benchmark, okay? And the first thing that you do is you set up your instrument and you have somebody else standing right here. You have them hold the, the graduated rod and then they shoot an elevation and they, and they get a reading, okay? And so let's say for the sake of discussion that that benchmark is at an elevation of 100 feet, okay? And then they take a reading and they read 5.51. Okay, so what that means is, if this is 100, and this distance is 5.51, how high is the instrument? 105.51. So right here, the height of the instrument is 105.51. That's the height of the instrument. Then the next thing that you do is you find another point down the way. We'll call this benchmark two, so maybe benchmark one and benchmark two, and then the guy with the, the rod or whoever's holding the rod, they, do, 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 they go on down to they go here it's perspective, they're off in the distance <laughs> <laughs> and then we take a reading this way, okay? And let's say that reading is 3.25. So let me ask you a question. If this, the elevation of this instrument is 105.51 and they take a reading of 3.25, what's the elevation of benchmark 2? There you go. So. The terminology for this is a backsight and a foresight. It's a backsight and foresight. So what is the height of the instrument minus that? 102.26. 102.26. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. So what you do, the next thing that you do is the person holding the leveling rod sits there and then the person with the instrument moves on down the line. And you keep doing that till you get to your target destination. So you start at a monument, let's say, and you end at benchmark two. Benchmark two might be the elevation of the house that you're considering or the elevation of this point or whatever. Okay? So let's keep doing this. So, let's, so I, I have an elevation of 102.26. Right? I take a back side. So what's this? 108.79. So add that plus that. So yeah, 108.79. Alright, I'm just going to do the hundreds. Alright, then take a four side. What do I get here? 98.29. Okay. Now, theoretically, in you know, 
ideal, uh, uh, everything's perfect world, I would be done. Okay? But that's not how you perform a differential level. You start at benchmark one, and then you go to the point where you're measuring, but what you then do is you go back to where you started. So we're going to keep going until we circle back to that monument. So let's keep going. What's the next height of the instrument? And then 102.61 minus uh, foresight? All right. Then add your next back site. 99.21. Then add your next, or subtract your next four site. 91.32. 91.32. All right. So anybody who remembers this, what can you tell me about this, this survey? If you hired this person to do this survey, what would be your next step? Sorry, we would fire them, right? <laughs> Why would you fire them? They're way off. They're way off. So, just so everybody remembers, the idea is that if you start a survey at 100 feet, a start a differential level at 100 feet, you better end at 100 feet. And if we haven't done that, we are way off. We're off. How much are we off? 8.7. <laughs> Alright, so, watch this. Watch it. I want everybody to watch this. This is important. So the, the, the difference can be computed as the elevation final minus the elevation initial, which is minus 8.68, right? Divide by four. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. That's, that's the correction. That's the adjustment. I want to show you something else. Another thing that you can do is you can sum the back sites minus sum the four sites. Sum up all these back sites. Let's sum the back sites. So sum back sites, sum four sites. So somebody tell me what, if you add up all these back sites are, what you get? 19.63. Say again? 19.63. Now how about your four sites? 28.31. Now what's your back site minus your four site? 18.31. Boom, right? I know. Now, what happens in the real world is error. You're going to get error in a survey. It, it just it is what it is. Um, not holding the rod perfectly level, you know, sight errors, whatever. There's, there's oodles of, of reasons why you could have uh, you know, uh, an error that you need to account for. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust this survey based on the, the, the observed error. So our error is 8.68. We have a total of four elevation recordings that we've made. So 8.68 divided by four, so our correction, is positive 8.68 over four, which is positive 2.17. Why did I change the sign? Because the error, the error is negative, so I have to add to that to get it back to 100. So how do I adjust these elevations? Well, what I do is I start at 100, I add 5.51, subtract 3.25, but then add my 2.17. I have to correct that. So for this first row, if I start at 100, add my back site, subtract my foresight, and then add my correction, what do I get here? Four, five? Four, three. I got four, three. Four, three. All right. Next one. So I then say, okay, 104.43. I add my 
my 6.53, subtract my 10.5, then add my correction. Two point six three plus my back sight minus my foresight. Add my correction. One hundred two point four five. Got a second. Yep. And then this value, one hundred two point four five, plus three point twenty seven, minus seven point eight nine, plus my correction. One hundred. Hundred. Boom. Start and end at a hundred. So what was your target elevation? Your target elevation is 102.63. So. Have y'all done, done that? Right? Okay. Right. Makes me feel better. Alright, any questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, the 8.3 for your correction, you have a positive 8.68, what I missed. So, look, look right here. Our error was negative because we started at 100. We shouldn't end at 100. So, it's too low. So, we have to add to that. So, if, so if this was like 106, right? So, our error would be positive, but the corrections would be negative to bring it back down. So, you're always just sort of going in the opposite direction of your correction or of, of your error. Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? All right. I have one last one for you. One last. I have a traverse. This is simple, I promise. And the numbers here are a little more like real life, if you will. So I have a traverse that's run from point B to point K. And if I know the coordinates of point K, find the linear closure, find the error. Okay? So this is probably more total stationing. Okay? So just so everybody's clear, when you perform a differential level, there is a goal. The goal is to determine elevations. You know, Z, if you will. A traverse, the goal is to determine x comma y, the coordinates of a given point. So traverse is x marks the spot on the map. Differential level is how high up or, uh, above sea level you are. Now, let me explain how a traverse works. You set up on, so let's say that I start here. Here's my benchmark, right? So I set my instrument right here. I sight that, then I turn, shoot the next point. Set up on that point, back sight, set to zero, turn, and shoot. So you keep doing that. And so whenever you look at a traverse data set, what you're going to find is distances and bearings. So those are sometimes you know, maybe reported as azimuths. But, um, you're looking at the distance between these points and the overall bearing between them. Okay? Sound good? Okay. Now, let's look at this up here. Let's see if we can let's see if we can do some, some figuring here. So this is point B. This is point C. Now, why am I drawing it this way? Okay, 
Well, what does the table tell me is going on between point B and point C? What's the table telling me? Well, it's telling me the distance is 487.52 feet. But why do I have B down here and C up there? Well, from B to C, it's telling me I go northeast, right? Okay. So, let's do this. What's that angle? Eighteen degrees twenty-two minutes, right? So if that's eighteen twenty-two, what's that angle? Well, actually, actually, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to handle this a little bit. More. What I'm going to do is I'm going to determine departures and latitudes. Now, departures and latitudes is just a fancy way of saying the x and y components of that shift. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this is L sine theta, this is L cosine theta. Now here's why I'm doing that. You all are probably used to the X being associated with the cosine and the Y being associated with the sine, right? Y'all are probably used to that, like X cosine Y sine. Why do I have them backwards? Because when you're looking at bearings, Bearings always start from the y-axis, and the angle is measured that way, right? So if you're doing that, remember the sine and the cosine are off 90 degrees. So because I'm measuring the angle from the y-axis and not the x-axis, when I take you know, my trig functions, I have to swap them to get the change in x and change in y. Does that make sense? All right, so what is the length times the sine, and what is the length times the cosine? I'm curious. We'll say two decimal places. Six eight. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Now, go ahead and do the one between C and D. Go ahead and do, and it'll be the same thing. Just the length times the sine of that angle, the length times the cosine. And I want to make a point about that here in a second. You give me the values and then we'll, we'll look at something with the signs here in a second. I got a value for me? But what about the Y? 39. It was like 0 0.02. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Okay? I'm going to make this negative. The one on uh, between C and D. Why am I doing that? Well, Let's look at this. I'm up here up top. That's my x-axis. That's my y-axis. Now, here's the thing. Between C and D, I go southeast, right? So if I go southeast, I'm going essentially this way, right? So from B to C, I went up and to the right, so these two values were positive. Between C and D, 
going southeast. That's positive. I'm going down on the y-axis. So that's negative. So the reason I'm making this negative is because of context. This is southeast. If this was southwest, they'd both be negative. Because think if I'm graphing this, then that, that's a third, that's quadrant three, if it was southwest, right? Make sense? Okay. So if that's the case, tell me what's going on, on the, the between the third. This, the second one's going to be negative because of context. Anybody got one for the first one? 809. 872. And then the next one. There we go. That's not too bad, right? Have y'all done this? Okay, good. All right. So if you've got that, the rest should be pretty straightforward. So here are my x and y coordinates of my point at the beginning of the traverse on a map that's referred to as your northing and easting. So I'm starting here. I go up this much, or go over this much, go up this much. So what are my coordinates of point C? How do I do that? Well, I take my original coordinates and I add my departures and latitudes. All right. So. What are the coordinates of point C? And then uh, uh, the northern. Point zero eight. Point two eight. Two eight. All right. So if you've got that, are you all okay with me just filling in the rest? So start at point C for the easting. I go over 788.2, so that puts me at 9679.14. This is going to put me at 11674.29. And this one's going to put me at 10506.86, 11511.27. Sound good? Now, are those the coordinates of point K? No, right? They're off. Why are they off? Because there's error. Well, how much are they off? Well, let's look at the northing. The northing is supposed to be 11, 511.15. It's actually coming out as 11, 511.15. Uh, or sorry, no, it's supposed to be 11, 5, 11, 15, coming out as 11, 5, 11, 27. So I propose that the error in the y direction is 0.12. Now, it actually doesn't matter which direction you do the subtraction, because when we compute the linear error, we're going to break out the Pythagorean theorem, so we're going to square this value anyway. So, so it really doesn't matter. For the x direction, we say 10,506.86 minus 10,507.23. That's um, negative 0 0.37. So the error is the square root of ex squared plus ey squared. And so when you plug and chug, that ends up being something like 0 0.39 feet. That, now, would you keep that surveyor on staff? <coughs> I would. I mean, you're talking about measurements that are, you know, close to three football fields, and they're off by about that much. That's pretty good. You yeah. know, that's pretty good. Y'all did this, right? More than likely, you're not going to have to remember how to define the chart. But to be honest, in the end, if all they're asking for is error and they give you the data, you should be able to do that. I mean, like, I think the chart makes it easy, but 
you don't have to do it that way. Does that make, does that make any sense? I mean, if I give you between point A and point B a uh, distance and a bearing, you should be able to compute the departure and latitude and the new coordinates without this chart. You, you see what I mean? You don't have to set it up that way if you're doing it on the exam. I'm saying if they don't give you a chart, that shouldn't impede your ability to do the problem. So it, that, that would be my overall point. Any questions? If we were doing this with azimuths instead of bearings, will we still just plug in that actual azimuth for the data? No. Because, uh, well, I wouldn't, and, and here's the reason why. Um, I'd have to, I, I don't think you'd have too many errors from a numerical side, but I think you might have error on signs, like positive text. I would always just convert to vary and then do it that way. Be, again, because of the signs. So that's, just, that's what I would do. Because, I mean, this method is sort of assuming that your angle is between zero and nine. All right, one other thing, we're not going to meet next week. Okay, I didn't, I sort of glossed over this part, so let me get to discuss some logistics because I was talking about that. Um, next week, we're not going to be here. I also don't have my quiz uploaded yet. Here's what I'm thinking of doing. I'm going to do a transportation review. Hopefully, I have time. I've got a field test coming up uh, next week, so I'm going to be a pretty busy guy. Uh, my plan is to upload a transportation review and then have a single quiz which kind of covers both. I think there's enough material here to do a review, but I don't want to, I think the problems in the end are pretty quick. So my goal is between now and next Wednesday to upload a transportation review and do a quiz on both. But for now, it's Cheddar's time or Longhorn. Thank you. You're, you're quite welcome. That's all I have. Sign in sheet. Uh, I will need that if somebody does. Oh, yeah. Oh, and uh, T3, hang out for a little bit.